Since this is pi data, I wanted to show you something with BitQuery that is really fun. Everyone here is a Python enthusiast? Yes? You, you know what are the most popular Python libraries? So, well, do you know BigQuery? I already showed you a little at the beginning. But in BigQuery, we have a lot of public data. And everyone here, everyone gets one free terabyte every month to analyze whatever data you can find in BigQuery. And one data set that I have not publicized enough, but I find really cool, is that all the downloads done with PIP, PIP, they are all being uh, published here, streaming every minute. So you can come to these tables and, for example, if we go to look what were the project's most, the most popular libraries, you can just find it. So for example, let me write a query, file project, and let me count. How do I do my count of everything that is being downloaded? It's harder to type with one hand. Group by one, order by two, descending order, limit 100. So this is a real cool way to see what is happening with Python, what, is, what are people downloading. Um, can I zoom this in? Uh, so these were the most popularly downloaded libraries yesterday. PIP, SIX, Botocore, Python, Data Util, STC, Ramfer, etc. But it's, this is really fun if you have your own obscure library and you want to see how people are adopting it or what countries are downloading it. Uh, you can see it here and not only find out the number. Turns out most of these libraries are super popular because people are just launching 1,000 VMs, 10,000 VMs every day. So it doesn't really count. But you can go and find on any on every dimension by operating system, by kind of CPU, and you can find really what things are being downloaded together and how different systems work. Um, uh, I, I don't have a lot more to say here, but if you have any questions, if you want to try it out, uh, you can find the data here. Any question? Yes? Uh, TensorFlow question. Yufeng! Gas! TensorFlow question. <laughs> yeah, just a quick one on TensorFlow. So I was wondering how you could actually integrate um, things like unbounded collections into TensorFlow to train your model and do stuff like that. I integrate what collections? Uh, unbounded collections, like for example in Beam, you have your P collections and so on. Um, so how do you use that in the context of TensorFlow? Because I see you've been loading stuff into memory. So what if the stuff that you're trying to train on can be fit, fit into memory? Yes. Okay, so the question is around... Um, training data that is bigger than what you can fit into memory. Yeah. And you know, that's absolutely a very like, real, you know, real world scenario. And this is where um, the input function kind of comes into play. You can, TensorFlow A has semantics for um, basically streaming data in. So you can, um, like there are other formats, right? Like a NumPy array cannot be streamed. It's just not a format that's streamable. But you know, a lot of the kind of, so the one I'm, I'm thinking of is, uh, it's called the TF record. So TensorFlow has its own kind of um, protobuf, like JSON-like binary format that you can uh, write out. And so if you, you can do that as either a pre-processing step or you can do a live conversion and then, you know, stream it in that way. And that will enable it to load in to its memory buffer and shuffle within that buffer as it's reading out samples. The other option is to use, um, you know, you mentioned Beam, you know, and I'll, I'll mention Spark as well. You know, both of them, and, and like Hadoop file systems and things like that, have ways of reading, of streaming data out. And they all have Python libraries for doing that. So you could just call those Python libraries from your input function, and now you're streaming data in, you know, one batch at a time or several batches at a time. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, sure. So, so do you know, like offhand, does it have any integrations with BigQuery and all for yeah. reading and stuff? So, so on the point of BigQuery, um, there is a tf.cloud now, and I think it's like tf.cloud.bigquery, and you can read from BigQuery natively from TensorFlow now. So, is Felipe around? Oh, he's in conversation. But yes, in short, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Other questions? Um, hi, thanks for the presentation. So uh, I got a question like, is there any way in the TensorFlow that, let's say I, I'm preparing a data set and uh, I have numerical, categorical, and some other variable which contains the paragraphs. Paragraphs? Yeah. Okay. Let's say like a logs. Like a what? Oh, logs. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything uh, available in the TensorFlow packages that uh, some techniques it has so that I can make it into uh, some kind of unique representation in the columns so that I can use it for my modeling. How long is the text per uh, value, per so, row? Uh, it depends. Like, let's say I'm taking like a last 15, 30 minutes of logs in my uh -huh. case. So sometimes the unique columns are like 20, 30. But sometimes it goes up to 50. Uh -huh. Wait, so 50 what? Uh, 50 uh, rows, you can see. Right, but like what I mean is for each row, you said there's a column that has text? Just right, like exactly. the uh, random yeah. text. Single like text, a little message. Yeah, single text cell is a message okay. that contains 10 sentences you can think of. Sure. Yeah. So when you get into kind of freeform text, we're getting into like the natural language processing space, right. and you know, there's kind of a spectrum of answers from like the simple answers to like the really complicated implementations, right. yeah? So what, uh, what I'm currently doing is like I'm using the pandas uh, extract regular expressions mm -hmm. to extract those things and then just get some keywords. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking of something like if the TensorFlow has certain packages mm -hmm. or inside which can do the job much easier here. So it doesn't have anything built in like kind of what you're talking about, like a built in out of the box uh, natural language processing toolkit, uh, but you can certainly apply you know, any a number of existing, you know, NLTK is a classic one, natural language toolkit. Um, alternatively, if you wanted to, you could also use the Google um, text API, the natural language API that uh, Kaz showed earlier, and you can use that to pull out um, salient entities. And so what it'll do is it'll pull out like the entities from the sentence along with scores of like how relevant they are, and it will score the phrases in terms of um, positive or negative sentiment and things like that. So that's useful for like specific use cases. I, I don't know if it, that particular piece will be useful for you, but um, that that's one option for like a simple pre-processing because you're doing in that case you would be pre-processing using um, an existing model, right? An existing text model. But presumably, if we wanted to think, you know, more uh, bigger. The kind of messages in your particular data set is going to be kind of um, phrased in a particular way, use particular vocabulary that is specific to your use case. And so ideally you would be able, to, you would extract out just that one column, just all the text stuff that you have and train a dedicated text model that understands your vocabulary of your data set. Right? And so then it will be able to uh, pull out salient features with much higher confidence, much higher accuracy and performance. Right. So, okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> so kind of layering machine learning on top of each other, right? right? right. You're like doing training one thing, using the outputs of feeding it into another, yes. and so like, yes. you know, Still you zoom me out on the like architecture. Still repository containing the field specific vocabulary sets to process in here. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, other questions? Also, questions for Kaz and Felipe wandered off, but. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if I have a large data set and I want to uh, train it iteratively, uh, and uh, in Keras, like we use da uh, data iterator uh, to train, like in uh, TensorFlow data sets, can I make my own uh, data set into TensorFlow data set? Are you referring to like the data sets API in TensorFlow, the new? Yeah. 
Yeah, so when, what do you mean when kind of you make your own data set into, sorry, I didn't completely Casting follow. into a TensorFlow data set. Mm -hmm. Wait, sorry, I missed the uh, beginning part. Is, is there a way that I cast my own data set, for instance, like a CSV file into uh -huh. TensorFlow data set? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so the data sets API allows you, there's like a whole bunch of ways to read in uh, data. Like CSV is one type. Um, you can also pass in a Python generator. So that's, that just opens the door to just about anything you want, right? Like anything you can wrap in a Python generator and yield out values. Um, and then I forget all the other ones. But like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different things. And, and you know, you clearly have played with it a little more um, than, than perhaps other folks. So I'll, I'll mention it. I didn't show it today, right? The data sets API is like a relatively new feature in, in the TensorFlow library. Um, support for distributed data loading and um, you know iteration, shuffling, batching, and all, all those semantics. Um, it's just a much cleaner API surface. So yeah, definitely. Um, so thank you for bringing it up, and I definitely encourage folks to check that out as kind of the de facto you know new standard for for working with data sets. And I just don't like the name because it's like. When I say data sets, you don't know if I'm talking about data sets like in the general sense of like data, sets of data, versus like the dot data sets API, but that's gripes. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I would like to hear your views. What, what is the, dif what is, uh, the distinct differences between, uh, or how does TensorFlow compare to PyTorch? So I haven't um, had too much time uh, with PyTorch, unfortunately. Uh, I know they both kind of come a lot from, they originate largely from the same kind of roots in Theano and have a lot of stuff based there. And in terms of functionality, like they both do, um, I mean, largely the same, like there's so much commonality. Like you look at Keras, you look at um, MXNet, all these other libraries, like all the common things that you would do are supported across all of them. It's just like, par for the course at this point. Um, I would argue that the big, one of the big draws for TensorFlow uh, for me is the community, is being able to go on Stack Overflow and the question I'm thinking about is already answered as opposed to like, I can't even figure out how I want to phrase it for, you know, the community is just so much bigger with TensorFlow and the support is there. Um, that being said, I do recognize that you know one of the big things with PyTorch that people like is that uh, immediate execution, right? Not not having to wait on the response uh, when when you construct that graph and then make a session, et cetera, et cetera, as you would with TensorFlow. So right now you can um, in TensorFlow 1.4 in Contrib there is um, TensorFlow eager mode, and so you can enable that flag and it will allow you to basically you can create something in the graph and you can just execute it right away. You don't need to create a session. You don't need to do the session.run stuff anymore. So that's kind of where that's going. And that's, you know, available today in a, you know, relatively stable form. Hi, uh, this question is perhaps for Cass. Hey, Cass. Question for you. Question was... Do you know if there's any difference between the engine used by YouTube for closed captions and the engine for GCP, yes, GCP speech API? Any difference? Uh, also, you question was the YouTube. Difference between the YouTube closed caption engine and uh, I don't know anything about <laughs> that. Sorry. You can, do you know anything about uh, the YouTube, what do you say? YouTube what? Closed caption. Crocs? Subtitles. Subtitles, speech recognition for subtitles. Uh, no, I don't know anything about that. Is it the same engine? Do we know any details on how that's No, no, I don't know anything. Yeah. Mm. Sorry about that. <laughs> and maybe we are not allowed to, you know, talk much about the details about YouTube. Yeah. We only talk about the public, the, the paper from the YouTube team, such as the recommendation. Used it. Yeah. Ah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Like, you, the YouTube team did publish a huge videos data set. I, I don't know if you're, you're maybe aware of that. It's like 
8 million YouTube videos that are labeled and annotated. Uh, so really useful for any kind of video machine learning training use cases you know you might have. Um, yeah, so a lot of cool public data sets out there. That's like a whole nother talk. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in terms of the speech recognition, I don't think there's so many different parallel projects inside Google. <laughs> so I, it's highly possible that we are sharing the same backend. Yeah, yeah, Android team and YouTube team and the Google Speech yeah. API. Because you're, you're specifically referring to the automatic subtitle generation? Yeah. So, mm, yeah. So, I, I suspect that's just like different versions kind of lagging behind each other or something. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll, I want to, I think this is largely, this is largely true, is like most of the kind of most if not all of the state of the art like research that's coming out of like Google research and things like that, that's, it's all being published. And so um, some of it with more publicity than others, but like you know, the, the tech is there, like at least in principle. Um, it's building out the scalable system to support something as large as YouTube, right? Of like doing that at that kind of scale that is like the really hard engineering challenge. Oh, between like speech API versus YouTube subtitle? I have no, I have no idea. <laughs> oh, you can't see it. Yeah. Huh? You can't see it? No, uh, I have no, I, have, I really <laughs> don't know. I, I haven't, like there's no way to really see how good the YouTube subtitling is like from that external perspective. You know, like I, I wouldn't be able to figure that out, I guess. Okay, um, so if I have a use case that is automatic, automatic generation of karaoke lyrics. Yes. You know, creating time tags. So which one, which products will you recommend? Oh, interesting. Or, uh, a automatic karaoke lyrics, lyrics generation. generation. From, the, from songs? Yes. But you may have to build your own, train your own model for that because it's not a generic, you know, dictation kind of. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but that, that has to be interesting. Oh. Right, right, right. Right. Thank you, thank you. Maybe you can join YouTube team and find out. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks like the, yeah, yeah, the pizza has pizza. finally arrived. Yeah. No more starving. Thank you so much. Thank you.